Okay. I'm going to do this without a mic, sir. Can have it, Joe. Too bad. All right. I'd like to welcome everybody to the Kaylee Club. We'll be lost without this club. And this is a lecture sponsored by the 1916 Committee. Before we even get underway with some housekeeping announcements, we have bad news. Um, we found out this evening, some of us, or I did, that Irene O'Rourke passed away yesterday. Mm -hmm. Irene was a stalwart of the Irish American community here. And uh, she's been ill for a while, and we haven't seen her for quite a while, but she was a great, great asset to any organization she joined, and she joined many, including the Cayley Club. Mm -hmm. It was always a joy to walk into a joint and see Eileen. Boss. She always had a story, and uh, she's really going to be missed. Maybe uh, downstairs we can all raise a toast to her, and uh, maybe somebody can sing a party glass. I don't know. Not me, though. But anyway, the 1916 committee here, we have monthly lectures at the Cayley Club. Uh, tonight we have a very special event, and uh, it's we do much more than just uh, have lectures, okay? The organization is working and has been working since its founding in 2014 for a united Isle, which is the goal of the uh, rebellion in 1916 and it's the goal of the struggle during the troubles, however you want to define it. And it still happens in the reality, but we are working towards that goal. And it's a very difficult struggle to this day because of the duplicity and lying and cheating by the British government, who has always discriminated against the Irish people with their unionists in the six counties. Uh, you know, we got an election coming up on Tuesday. Just make sure you vote. Still in the north of Ireland, elections are being denied to the people there. Last May, there was an election. Sinn Féin won the majority. They should have been the first prime, uh, the first minister. The DUP, the unionist organization, refused to participate in the government. For six months, there was no government at all in the six counties. There was an agreement between the Dublin government and the London government that if it went six months without a government in, in action, there would be an immediate election. It should have happened on December 15th of this year. The new prime minister in London, I don't even know how to pronounce his name. It's just like, you know, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. He comes in and he says, no, we're not ready for an election. <laughs> the people down in Dublin from Fine again, I'm fighting fit or fail. No, we're not ready for an election now. We're going to wait till after the new year. So again, the people of the six counties have been disenfranchised. It's important to pay attention to this stuff because we can actually play a role in it uh, to a certain extent. American, Irish Americans have always been active in bring, trying to bring about a United Ireland. Uh, without going into too much detail, we have been lobbying our politicians here. Anybody afterwards who wants to get in on that movement so that the interests of Ireland are preserved through Brexit can talk to myself or Marie McGee after this is over, and we can give you templates for you to send to Congress and things like that. It's important that we jump in on that and uh, apply whatever pressure we can here from the congressional delegation. The 1916 committee at this point is greatly involved in raising funds to build a monument to the hunger strikers of 1981. We started this last May, uh, a year ago, May, last May. And we have been, thanks to the generosity of a lot of people in this room, very successful. There's no question now that we have, we will have a monument at the Finn Memorial site next spring. There's a lot of details that have to be worked out, but including the date that we're gonna have the thing unveiled, but it's gonna happen. And we want it to happen correctly, and we want it to happen in a dignified fashion to show our respect and our love to the 10 men who gave their lives. It's a beautiful granite monument that's going to be down there. 
hopefully, we're doing, well, no, I can't go into that. But one of the things we're going to do for sure is have a booklet that's going to be either sold or passed out. And we want people to write their memories of 1981 and the hunger strike. And this is an invitation to everyone here to join in on that. Now, obviously, you have to be a certain age <laughs> to remember. <laughs> but at the end of the night back there, Francis has these uh, little flyers. It outlines what we're asking people to do. I'm going to try to summarize it as quickly as I can. Uh, for those of us who are active during those long weeks are not getting any younger, nor are our memories getting any better. Now is the time for us to think about and share our personal and individual reactions we had at that time. The hunger strike changed lives. It certainly changed mine. I didn't write this, the woman who wrote it, uh, and it certainly changed a lot of people's lives. The question is, how did you personally respond to the deaths of the 10 political prisoners who refused to be criminalized? We ask that you tell the story that only you can tell, the story of how you responded to and were affected by the months of the hunger strike and the long lingering deaths of the 10 men who sacrificed their lives. If we, the living witnesses of the hunger strike do not take this time now to share what we saw and did then, when will we be able to? Please submit a response. There's an email address on this. And we're asking that people send them in by December 1st. There was a group of people from the 1916 committee who will edit them, get back to you with questions or whatever. But we want to share this for our children and our grandchildren. The monument will be there for a long, long time. We want to have this book available for other generations so that they understand what the Irish people have fought for on um, in the other side of the pond, so to speak. A couple of things to put in your calendar. On November 11th, the Friday night right here, the Tories are playing. They are brilliant. Traditional Irish music group, four people from you know Rhode Island, I think, or maybe Rhode Island, Massachusetts. Bob Druin, Dean Robinson, Torin Ryan, and Josh King. If you've never heard them, it's breathtaking. You don't want to miss this. If you like that trad music and beyond, they sing ballads and things like that. It's well worth it. So it's a Friday night, November 11th. That's Veterans Day. You go to the parade in Princeton. You go somewhere and have dinner. Then you come over here. You have dinner here. And then at 7.30, it's $20 for the public. It's $15 for members. So if you're not a member, join them. I get it. Well, you save five bucks. <laughs> uh, then Saturday, no, that Saturday after Thanksgiving, which is November 26th at 7 o'clock, out at the Blackstone River Theater, Kevin Doyle's is putting on a show, Ross Common Souls, and it's titled Health to the Lady. Uh, most people here have probably seen Kevin, and he can cut a rug, so you don't want to miss this. And every time Ross Common Soul has played at the park, down in Narragansett, Newport, it's a very good crowd, so, uh, you know, you can get a hold of this posters uh, up here where you can find out the information, but it's $20 in advance to 24 the night of the um, show. And lastly, our next lecture is going to be here December 2nd, Friday night, the first Friday in December. Tim Hoyt from the Newport Naval War College is going to speak. He's going to be speaking on the 1920s, the Civil War, the aftermath of the War of Independence. And Tim has spoken here a few times. He's a brilliant historian. He just was in Ireland at many conferences and stuff like that. He's excited about coming back. <laughs> which surprises me in some ways, but he has, <laughs> he has been in Scotland, Ireland, and talking and saying, and he comes here and he gives us the same speech. So it's a real serious historical analysis of the period he's going to be talking about. But tonight, we have something that we've advertised as an evening of songs and stories. In the email, I tried to quote that referred to uh, Dublin in the rare old time raised on songs and stories of heroes of great renown. And tonight we're going to try to make that come alive. Finbar Doyle is going to be the song end of it. 
And we are so grateful that he is here. Some people saw him back in September when he warmed up, I guess, to the Celtic heaven. I wouldn't want to call it the opening act, but he did sing a couple of songs for us. And his, his talent was obvious. I'm sure he's going to take our breath away tonight with uh, what he's got planned. And Kathleen Savage here is uh, the person who's going to tell the stories tonight, okay? And Kathleen has been active in the struggle for Irish reunification for a long time, since the 80s. I met her back in the 80s, and we were both younger people then. <laughs> but I never went to Boston to a picket line, to a fundraiser, to down at the embassy, <laughs> to a, a march for the hunger strike where Kathleen wasn't there. And, She's never stopped fighting on about this. And she's been with the Ladies Ancient Order of um, Hibernians for many years and has won awards, uh, as we mentioned in the thing. Uh, <coughs> mainly, her reputation was built on writing letters to prisoners in Long Kesh, which was the prison, the H Block prison. And uh, she has been many times over there and she's visited in the prison, she made contacts with so many people, you just dropped names like it's unbelievable. <laughs> and she was known, as a matter of fact, as the queen of Long Kesh by the press prison because she wrote so many letters and contact with so many people, so many birthday cards, Christmas cards, a, a, a remarkable um, reputation. But she is not a historian, okay? But Kathleen genuinely made history. So that might be more important than being a historian. But she's not really comfortable as a public speaker. And so we developed this format anyway tonight. Marie is going to ask some questions of Kathleen who will answer. And we were going to have some songs and then some stories, and then some songs and then some stories. And at a certain point, when Marie decides it's right, we'll open it up for questions from the floor, and then we'll end up with some more songs. Clear enough? Yes. Okay, yes. spin it off. Take it away. Well, the last time I was here, I wasn't prepared for anything. <laughs> and for the last week and a half, I've been preparing nonstop. <laughs> I'm 90 miles from Dublin town. I'm in the H. Bruxelles. To help you understand my plight, the story. Now I'll tell, I'm on the blanket protest, my efforts must not fail, for I'm joined by men and women in the cash and armor jail. It all began one morning, it was direct to Castle Ray. and oh, it was three years ago, it seems like Yesterday, for three days, kicked and beaten, I then was forced to sign confessions that convicted me of crimes that were not mine. Sentenced in the Dipla court, my protest, it began. I could not wear the prison gear. I was a banked man. I'll not accept your status and I'll not be criminalized. And that's the issue in the blocks for which we'll give our lives. Over there in London town, how they laugh and sneer. If they could only make us wear their lonesome prison gear. And prisoners of war is what we are and that we will remain. 
And as the usual in the blocks, or which will die in vain. Been deeping round the romper room, as I once a sorrow. I've been frog marched down the land and, and dragged back by the hair. I've suffered degradation, humility, and pain. Though the struggle cannot falter, British torture is in vain. A wit and news that's coming in. A protest must not fail. For now we're joined by thirty girls in Arma Women's Jail. So pay attention, Irish men and Irish women too, and show the free state rulers that their silence will not do. Oh, it's 90 miles from Dublin town, it seems so far away. And there's more attention to our fight in the USA. But now you've heard the story of my filthy living hell. Remember 90 miles away, I'm still in. Well, I don't know if you've ever been on the internet and go down a rabbit hole that you didn't want to go down. Oh, yeah. On the rabbit hole, and uh, oh, about two days later, I came out of it. Um, had, uh, I had learned a song about uh, 30 years ago and it never came back into my mind. And I had sang it to myself in the shower. That's not true. <laughs> um, but I had sang the song for years to myself and um, it was written by Tom McCreish, who was uh, Raymond McCreish's uh, first cousin. And it was a song called Southern Wind. It hasn't really been recorded by anyone. I've only heard it, one person sing this song. And when I heard it, I loved it. And then I went down the rabbit hole of how it came about and where it came from. So this is a song called Southern Wind. And it's basically, it's um, Ray McCreish came from Camlock in, uh, in Armagh. And uh, he, um, his first cousin was looking at Ireland and saying, you're silent. There isn't a word out of you. You have nothing to say about the hunger strike of 1981. The Irish government were silent, most, most partly, um, and this is the song that called The Southern Wind. In Arma, in the heart of the land, the sweet town of Camlock, it lies. Me townland a thousand years or more, stood proud and undaunted, in history and law, do they come? Do the southern winds come? When I was 19, they took me away. In Bestwood Parks, I was tarred three days. In foreign and nexus, they did testify that their ways and laws I must satisfy, do they come? Do the southern winds come? Do they know that I die for love of them? Do they know who has really sinned? Do they realize, will they save us now? A boy, the southern wind. Do they come? Do the southern winds come? Though strong the oak, it still will bend. In centuries, we prayed it would end. Until at last, 
the pen took the bread and no broken hearts no more could take till they come to the southern winds come my heart it is broken the southern wind blows alone i go in the night and alone to live alone to die alone to bear our own fight do they come do the southern winds come in our ma in the heart of the land the sweet town of camlock it lies me townland a thousand years or more so proud and undaunted in history and law do they come do the southern winds come Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say thank you to, uh, to the, uh, the club and to Kathleen. Um, we both crossed the border today and we never got checked. Yeah. <laughs> We're in Rhode Island, baby. We're going to go out for tonight, I promise. We got two sleeping bags downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Nice. I met Kathleen this last summer. I went on a trip with the uh, Hibernians. It was a fact-finding tour of Northern Ireland. And um, we met with a lot of uh, families of the Troubles. And um, I realized that Kathleen was a wealth of knowledge and experience, and I wanted to share it with you. Uh, so Kathleen, I understand that you got involved in 1985 starting from a desire to visit the six counties and find out what life was like for the Catholics. You were pointed to Martin Galvin. Would you tell us about that first trip and the anti-internment rally? Well, I had been twice to Ireland, to the South. I had several, uh, two tours. And I made a resolve to myself that I wouldn't go back to Ireland until I went to the six counties and I saw firsthand what people were living under, what, what it was like to live under British rule and to be a Catholic. And so I hooked up with Martin Galvin, who was the editor of the Irish People, and they, they ran a tour. They ran a tour to the six counties where we were put up with the prisoners. No, it wasn't. <laughs> I can hear like a. Um, oh, is there a downstairs? No, no, no. no, no John's coming downstairs. I'm sorry. And we were put up with local families, and they took care of us. I never experienced hospitality like it. But every day we were brought to see different places to see, to hear from the locals, to hear what life was like. It was very heavy. To hear about the um, families who had prisoners inside, um, people that had loved ones that were murdered, people that were stopped at checkpoints, their homes were raided. Um, it was very emotional for me. And um, it was a, a very, um, it was a great experience, but a very sad experience. So during the day, we, we had this heavy, heavy um, talks and everything. So at night, they so they had a social bar every night to take off the edge from this um, sadness. Thank you. Thank you so much, <coughs> Kathleen. And I know that firsthand um, this summer when I went on my, the trip, I didn't know what to expect. And about three days in, I uh, contacted my friend Magella and I said, I don't know if I can take this anymore because it was so sad what they lived with. But all the years that I had gone to the, to the south of Ireland, like many of you have, you know, it was all fun and dancing and traditional music. 
this was like nothing I had ever experienced. But at nighttime, it was. It was just like, you know, fun and uh, crack and all of that stuff. So um, would you tell us uh, in one experience that you had that you would explain to me that was quite telling was the drive on the bus into the prison. That's one example that was really pointed out a lot to me. Well, my first visit to Lancash, um, I took the prison bus from Belfast. We met at Sebastopol Street, and there was a bus that went into the prison. And there were a lot of women and their children and went in and we had I had to go in and give the prisoner's name. And then we were put called. The prisoner's name was called, and we got into a bus. And it was a bus that opened like like the back of an ambulance, and there were seats on each side. And as they were going driving, they would go fast and then they would slow over the go real slow, and you could hear the hum of the motor. And it was just so, um, I don't know, it just made me feel nauseous and um, my stomach would just jump. And so by the time I got there, I wasn't feeling very good. And by the time I left, I was emotionally wrecked um, to think that I was leaving this person I was visiting and um, knowing what they were taking inside this prison the torture and everything. And so every time I left, I felt either I had an awful headache, I felt extremely sad. I just didn't, I felt unwell. And that that sounds like um, many of the stories that we've heard about how the British not only would murder the people and, and these families that they would destroy, but after the deaths, when the families were still mourning, they would go back and, and dig more. And um, I remember I went to visit uh, Mickey McCreesh, whose brother uh, Ray was one of the hunger strikers. And um, his home, he opens up his home to anybody who comes by. And it just so happened that um, my friend Magella had set it up and we went and looked in the house. So I, I was just asking him about the experience of it. And <laughs> He talked about how his father had these dogs that he just loved and uh, they would be his father and the dogs would go out and go for walks up the mountain that was nearby. And after uh, Raymond died, a few days after he died, the dogs disappeared. And it was, it was obvious and it was well known that it was the British who just you know, the, the suffering, the, the torture, it just knew no end. So you uh, were very involved with the cards and the letters that were sent to the prisoners over the years. Could you tell me how you got involved in that, uh, Kathleen, the, the letters? Well, on the first trip over, there was a woman that was on this trip and she came on the bus and said she had just visited someone in Long Cash and would others be willing to write to this fellow's friends? And so she asked for people to give their names. And she looked at me and said, would you give me your name and address, Kathleen? Which I did. And a month later, I received a, a letter from Peter McVeigh. And he was in Long Cash serving life, a life sentence. And his mother had just died the month before. And he said he was not allowed to go to the wake or the funeral. And he was completely distraught. Um, he had a brother that was also in Long Cash, his brother John. And John was his a completely innocent man, never got involved in anything. And he was um, his alibi. And because of that, they tortured this man so badly that um, he had to have several operations um, because of this uh, torture that he took. And um, it was, he, Peter tried to clear his name a few years ago, and um, John died before anything happened in the courts. And um, as far as the other letter writing, I went to an Irish festival, 
And there was a fellow there with prison list. And it was a list that um, this fellow, Mike Duffy from Pennsylvania, he put these lists out monthly. And so I started to write to the prisoners on from this list birthday cards. And I had 500 cards written up, or t- made up, excuse me, from the uh, from a printer who did the Norway books in Boston and Lynn. And, um, so I had 500 cards written up in Irish. And um, because of that, I received several thank you cards from the prisoners. They were most grateful to hear from somebody from the States, just a recognition and just support meant a lot to me. So if you have a chance tonight, um, after this is over, if you wanna go over to that back table, um, Kathleen has brought a lot of the uh, letters the thank you notes, Um, there's newspaper clippings of different things that um, she uh, was involved with. I know this afternoon, uh, the Benz girls and I were looking through and I coming across and I'm like, Bernadette Devlin, and here she is with Bernadette Devlin, and then Jerry Adams and Martin McGinnis. And I mean, I'm just in awe because I'm one of those people that, you know, speak a lot of those high profile people. And uh, so it's not just the, the prisoners that she was involved in. Um, those people are high up in the IRA. They recognized Kathleen as well. Um, so does anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask Kathleen? Okay, Jerry? Let's say the, they finally acquiesce and be allowed to have a united Ireland. We've had over 100 years of issues with the British, the Protestants, whatever. What's going to happen to them up in Northern Ireland if now they become part of Ireland? Well, they really want everyone to be completely inclusive with the um, all the Catholics and the Protestants. Yes, but what will happen to those Protestants? You, you can't just say, okay, now they're our friends. Mm-hmm. Well, they're working towards peacemaking now. I mean, um, it, it's a gradual thing. And I really believe that the young people in this generation, the young ones, they're coming up. They're joining a lot of um, cross-community groups. We have a fella, Eamon Daly, that came from um, Philadelphia. And he's living in uh, Enniskillen, outside of Enniskillen, drum McKilly. And he has the Omar Basketball Club, and that's um, cross-community. And then I attended a a boxing club. Uh, They had a big do down at the um, Irish Cultural Center. And they came out, and they're um, they're from Belfast. They're from other parts of Northern Ireland. And they hooked up with the U.S. So, and they they were all Catholics and Protestants cross-community. I think these young people, they don't recognize um, the difference between okay. them. Well, that's good. Uh, so I hope this continues. Yeah. Because they, we all have to, uh, they have to live together. And I think it's the older generation that wants to hold on to these. Um, so the hatred, I hate to say it like that. But. I guess it's well, not yeah. That's right. Any other questions? Okay, we're going to bring Finbar back up to uh, play some more songs for us. Thank you. Like I could sing uh, these songs uh, all night long, and then I could, which is all into a state of depression, <laughs> <laughs> where literally you'd be seeing a counselor for the next two years. Or something. Two more years. Um, <laughs> then all the psychiatrists are very expensive. Might as well go into the bathroom and talk to yourself. Be um, but just thinking about something that was said. Mm-hmm. Just there now, um, 
I honestly think being an Irishman, uh, I have been to, to, to South Derry and I've seen what it was like back then. And today, um, young people don't want to fight. They don't want to kill each other. Um, they realize now they're probably more uh, aware of the alternative. And the alternative is not really an alternative. Uh, my father told me once there's nothing civil about a civil war. Um, people reference the troubles. Troubles is like when you can't get to work on time. When you think of troubles, uh, there's a way of, of, of how people think of it. Uh, the troubles, they're, they're not troubles. It, it's, it's a civil war. And the Irish people, both north, south, east and west, don't want any more uh, killing. They don't want anyone else to die. Because I talked to someone about it uh, back then, and I said, how young should someone be killed? At what age? You know, 18, 19, 12, 11, 5. It's happened. Um, and I think now, um, and, and, I, and I have been, you know, um, because of the songs, I've sort of got an education because of the music. Um, like, when I was younger, I mean, the first song I learned was Kevin Barry. Um, now, recently, the Irish soccer team got into the World Cup. And forgive me, but the shit hit the fan. <laughs> and it wasn't because it got into the World Cup. And the song itself was based on, um, the song was written, and it was based on the words that were written on a wall in Glasgow. Um, so the, the, the ignorance and the analogies that, like the sky, I mean, I, I can't believe that. I remember RTE1, RTE2, Bosco and Gayborn. You know, um, I don't remember ever having to watch the Irish football team on Sky TV. And they got railroaded. So the Irish people um, are probably very, very, you know, highly intelligent people. They're very well aware of what, uh, why should someone apologize? I mean, I'm going to talk about it. But why should anyone apologize at all? Um, these are our songs. This is our history. I did tell someone that if you look at the uh, the words of um, you know, Rule Britannia, they do that for a national anthem. If you listen, to, if you read the words of the Star Spangled Banner, it will tell you how ruthless the English were 200 years ago. They didn't care um, who was there. They would bomb men, women, and children. And um, so singing a, a song if it affects people a certain way, it's because they either understand. It's just songs to me are basically a history lesson. And um, and then I go into the rabbit hole and I can't get out. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I had been in South Derry because um, I lived in England for uh, five years and then I got deported. And it was great. <laughs> Um, but I, during that five years, um, I became great friends. Uh, one of my best friends um, was from South Derry. And when I went to visit him and his family, um, they brought me over to Balahi, um, where Thomas McAwee and, uh, and um, Francis Hughes are, uh, are buried. So um, Francis Hughes was probably the, the most wanted man in Europe. Um, because he's a, he, was a, he was the kind of man that didn't want to kill anyone. He just wanted them to leave. He had been beaten and tortured as a young man. And when I was thinking about um, the hunger strikers this week, um, I had found an old tape of uh, songs from within uh, the H blocks. And it... It was amazing to think about it, that the age of some of the hunger strikers was 23, 24, 25, 26. Only one of the hunger strikers was 30 years of age. The other nine were under the age of 30. And for them to sacrifice their life um, for, for what was right and wrong at the end of the day, that's what they were going to die for, what was right and what was wrong. So this song was called uh, The Boy from Tamla Duff. Mm -hmm. 
I thought he was the singer, not the talker. <laughs> As I walked through the Glen Shin Pass, I heard a young girl mourn. The boy from Tambladov, she cried, his three years dead and gone. And now my heart is torn apart for these brave men. To lose, oh, I'll never see the likes again of my brave Francis Hughes. Oh, I'll move and run the countryside, he often made the news. But they could never lay their hands on my brave Francis Hughes. And finally they wounded him and they captured him at last. And from the countryside he loved, but it took him to Belfast. Oh, for many his exploits were a torn in England's side. And the hills and glens became his home, oh, there he used to hide. And finally they wounded him and they captured him at last. Oh, from the countryside he loved, they took him to Belfast. Oh, from Musgrove Park to Crumlin Road, and death to H. Block cell. He went straight on the blanket, then on hunger strike as well. Is a will to win and it could never beat no matter how they tried they fought the battle they knew it and they fought him as he died as I walked through the glinching pass I heard a young girl mourn. Oh, the boy from Tambledov, she cried, his third years dead and gone. And now my heart is torn apart for this brave man to lose. Oh, I'll never see the likes again. Of Thomas McGlee and Francis Hughes. Oh, I'll never see the likes again of my brave bad dog Hughes. I want to sing a song for the women here tonight. <laughs> I'm not going to get in trouble. <laughs> um, around 1980-1981, um, Christy Moore received a letter from the Armagh Women's Prison uh, from a woman that was in the Armagh Women's Prison and um, she asked if he would write a song about the struggle of the women in Armagh as well because they had heard that uh, the song 90 Miles from Dublin Town had been banned by RTE. Um, so they wanted another song to be banned with it. <laughs> um, and subsequent to that, um, after the song was recorded and, and, and put out into the air, um, 
the lady who wrote the song was shot dead in Gibraltar by the SAS. So for all the power of England, um, they weren't able to arrest and put on trial uh, the three people who were killed in Northern Ireland. It was much easier for them to assassinate them in broad daylight in Gibraltar. And the woman's name was Mairead Farrell. This song is called On the Bridge. There's thirty people on the bridge and they're standing in the rain. They got my eye as they passed them by. They tried to explain why they were standing there. I did not want to hear when trouble gets too close to home. My anger comes to fear. With my eyes turned to the ground, I moved on. I covered up my ears and I held my tongue. The rain poured down relentlessly upon the picket line. And the empty words fell from my lips. Your troubles are not mine. Nothing happens when we know that. <laughs> Should have it fixed. <laughs> well, I had a carpenter. <laughs> Just thank God I'm not in the band. <laughs> right. Oh, God, now we're good. <laughs> right. It's not like it hasn't happened before. <laughs> oh, the rain it meant the colors were on the message, it was plain. Women are been strip searched in our man jail. Don't the rain. It made the colors run the message. It was plain. Women are been strip searched in Narma and Brixton jail. We kneel in adoration before refugees of stone, and our eyes turn to heaven. We're blind to what's going on. Six women hold a naked woman and down on the floor. Without trial or jury, she's a prisoner of war. Oh, the rain it made the colors around the message. It was plain. Women are been strip searched in our mad jail. Though the rain it made the colors run, the message it was plain. Women are been strip searched in our mad jail. Well Can we do another one or what we do? One more. The last time I was here, I don't know, somebody wasn't ready for it. I did three Caroline. 
Who came out of left field? We've got we will. You haven't seen me perform before, have you? sing songs about the H block and to me it's a beautiful thing because um, this is the first time I've really been to an event like back in the day I had been to several events in England um, and you were watched you know that's you were watched you know Kathleen will tell you that you know you were considered a sympathizer uh, you were considered in many cases to be a volunteer um, and sometimes that just wasn't the case. It was just that you wanted to help people who needed help. And uh, that's really what a lot of people in America did for the hunger strikers and have done for the peace process is they basically have spoken up where um, it, there's no silence. You, you can't have silence when you know there's something wrong. You have to do what's right. And, um, and that's important, you know. I'll do Sweet Carolina later on. <laughs> but I'm going to light you up a little bit now because I don't want you crying. I'm not paying for the therapy, I can tell you that. <laughs> Santa Claus is coming, you know that, don't you? Yeah, it'll be good. Oh, Jesus, you'll be broke. It was Christmas Eve, baby. In the drug tank, and an old man said, Son, you won't see another one. Then he sang us the rare old mountain dew. I turned the eyes away, and I thought about you. Thought him the lucky one. Came in at eighteen to one. God, I've got a feeling this year it's for me and you. So happy Christmas! How oh, I love you, baby. There's going to be good times when all our dreams become true. They got cars big as bars, they got rivers of gold, and the wind blows it through you, no place for the old. When I first took your hand on the cold Christmas Eve, you promised me Broadway was waiting for me. And you were handsome and pretty, queen of New York City, when the band finished playing. The curl hold for more. Sinatra was swinging, all the crowd they were singing. And we kissed on the corner, we danced strung up along. And the boys in the NY. Let's do it together, okay? And the boys from the NY choir were singing all the way. And those bells were ringing on Christmas Day. Well, I could have been someone, and so could anyone, and you took your dreams from me, when I first found you, I put them with me bed, and I kept them with my own, and I can't make it all alone, I built my dreams around. Singing all the way, and those bells were ringing on Christmas Day. There I was, I was coming down the middle of Cranston Avenue, and I ended up on America Street. <laughs> <laughs> there in the middle of the road was the red, white, and blue. Must be the Italian part of town. <laughs> <laughs> there I was, and I got out of the car and I looked around because who grabbed me by the hand only Kathleen and she said to me where are you going I don't know says I bitches I'll go there too so when we went to the social club and we had a drink then I had a drink and Kathleen had a drink and then she started talking and we had another drink and I started singing and Kathleen fell asleep 
You're a bum, you're a punk, you're an old whore and drunk. Laying there under the rip, and you're nearly dead in the bed. If somebody a maggot, be a she nosy rabbit. Happy Christmas, me arse, so I think it's our last. And the boys from the NYPD choir were singing all the way And those bells were ringing out from Christmas Day. Oh, little, oh, 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 and those bells were ringing out for Santa Claus Day. <laughs> oh yeah, Santa Claus, myself and Santa Claus will be going way back. <laughs> so far back we nearly fell into the chimney together. <laughs> okay, one more time for the roll, here we go. And the boys from the NYP choir was singing all in May. So we're going to have a united Ireland, we're going to have a peaceful island, we're going to have a beautiful green rock where we can go every year and not recognize any border. What county are you in? I'm in the county of Kildare. Where are you going? I don't know, but I'll go there with you. I'd like to give a shout out to our Zoom friends out there, Trish, Mary Beth, Magella, Magella Mary Ellen, thank you for joining us. So uh, Kathleen, you had told me about another prisoner, um, Seamus, who you, you also wrote to him. Um, would you tell us a little bit more about him? Well, as Seamus Dillon, it was spending time in McGedrick Prison, and I had sent a card to a Jerry Dillon, and he received the card, and he thank, sent me a thank you note saying thank you for the card, but it was really for, um, it was really my cousin, and um, anyway, he thanked me, and he asked me would I come to visit him in prison, and he, that his family wanted to get in touch with me. So I did get in touch with them. They were from Coal Island in County Tyrone. And I went with his mother and dad, the first visit to McGebry. And we had a few visits after that with his, he had children and um, went with his mother and his daughter. And um, we, we became friends over the years. And Seamus um, was, as I said, we were friends, and he was being released from prison. And so I, I was really ecstatic for him because he had an awfully hard life. Um, he had been in prison, and the first time he was in, his first wife left him. And then he came out and he remarried. And his second wife um, called, called on him. And uh, as they say, dropped a dime on him. So he was in prison again. And so when he was finally released this third time, a second time, I should say, um, he found a, a, a lovely woman and he remarried and had, was having a good life and very happy. And he, the reason he was in McGeffrey prison, I asked a Sinn Féin counselor, what was the difference of the ones in Lankesh and the ones in McGebery? And he said, well, don't get me wrong, there's still Republicans in McGebery, but they're against going back into the IRA. And, you know, they, they just want to have a peaceful life when they get out. We have no, um, you know, we don't feel any animosity towards them. We feel it, it's their privilege to do what they want. And so he got released. And when he was out, I went out to see him when he when he was released. And we had a wonderful time. Um, he was playing football. He was still playing football. And there was a game in um, right outside of Coal Island that I attended actually in Brackerville. 
which is part of Coal Island. He belonged to the Brackenville Club. And then after that, we had a social in the club. And it was just wonderful to see that he was free and enjoying life and everything. And then on December 27th of 1997, um, I had had a, a very pleasant day with my little niece and going out Christmas time. We went to the ice capades in Boston, came home and I received this phone call from his sister-in-law, Dolores, who I was very friendly with. And uh, she said, Kathleen, I have very bad news for you. And I said, well, um, is it Jimmy? I thought it was the father because he had been very ill in the hospital. And she said, no, it's not Jimmy, it's shaming. And uh, well, he was also had a nickname, sick. What happened was he was uh, had a second job as um, a bouncer at the Glen Gannon Hotel in Dungannon. And he was at this young people's disco and he heard the cars coming into the parking lot. And he and another couple of people went outside to see what was happening. And they were loyalists and they riddled him. And his, his, um, friend that was with them is paralyzed to this day. And the saddest part was um, that day earlier, I had received a call from my friend that lived in Lurgan, and she said, Kathleen, they got him. I said, who? She said, King Rat. And King Rat is Billy Wright. He was a loyalist that was uh, murdered so many Catholics. And when she said they got him in prison, I said, oh, God, I said, please be very careful tonight. They're going to kill a Catholic. I know. And um, she said, oh, uh, no, we're, we're very, you know, we'll be careful. And little did I think, uh, even think that it could be Seamus. And um, so it was awful by his family, his mother, elderly mother and father. And, um, but his brother, um, because of the desecration to the hunger strike body, some of them, his brother said he would not allow a postmortem without him being sitting there. And he sat there and watched as it, the postmortem. And it was so horrific that he suffered a nervous breakdown. And um, he was never the same. Roger was never the same after that. And uh, it was just terrific. And um, I'd like to just talk a little bit about a couple of other people that I got to know. Um, that their, two, their lives, too, were cut short. Uh, Sheena Campbell was a 29-year-old activist, Sinn Féin activist. She was studying law at, at um, Queens University in Belfast. And I would go down when I stayed in Lurkin, I'd go down to the Sinn Féin office and have chats with Sheena. She was brilliant. And she knew about the history of Ireland and the history of that area where she was from. And that year, I went to the end-time internment rally and I saw her and my friend said, oh, Kathleen, why don't you go over and say hello to Sheena? She's studying the law now at Queens. So I went over and congratulated her and everything. And there it was a few months later in October, she was going home to uh, Lurkin and it was on a Friday and always at the end of the week, she would stop into the Crown Bar in Belfast and have a drink. Not the Crown Bar. Excuse me, it was, um, I don't know, it was a hotel that's no longer there, sorry. It's no longer there, this hotel. Um, and she went up to the bar and she was sitting with her back to the door and never thought too much about anything, even though she had been receiving threats right along. And a gunman came up at point blank range and just shot her right in the back of the head. And that was instant. Um, I just couldn't believe it when I received that call. 
And then there was Rosemary Nelson, who was an Irish um, solicitor, and she was in the town of Lurgan. And I had gone up to her law offices because my friend's son was um, at her as a solicitor. He was trying to get bail from Crowman Road. And there was Rosemary, as sweet as could be, and she put on a cup, cup of tea for me. And um, I later saw her at the entire tournament. Uh, the night before the rallies, we would have a big do. And she was there supporting the Gavahi Road residents. And she came up behind me, put her hands over my eyes and said, guess who, guess who? And it was Rosemary. And my God, uh, whenever I heard on March 15, 1999, she was leaving her house to go to work and her car exploded. And she was killed instantly on the side of the road. And um, I didn't really know this man, but I did meet him, Pat Manukin, who was the solicitor from Belfast that was shot dead in front of his family on a Sunday afternoon, having his Sunday dinner in front of his wife and children. And his wife was shot also and recovered. But these are all cases of things that, horrific things that happened. And then there was um, a Dwayne O'Donnell, sorry. And I had been put up with his family on the Norway tour. And I was um, sending cards back and forth to the mother, you know, Christmas time. And um, they had put me up, they were so kind and everything. And I didn't hear this one Christmas, and I thought, well, this is strange. I, I hope they're not going to start writing or connecting. And that following March, she sent me a card, and she said, Kathleen, I suppose you didn't realize it was our Dwayne that was killed at Boyle's Bar in Kappa. And there were three men going into the pub. He was an IRA. He was only 17 years old, but he had joined the IRA. And they were riddled. Um, that was the um, the SAS that came along, um, special air service. And um, they were part of the British Army, and they came in and just, just riddled them. 17 years old. And it was, I had been up to Kappa one after this incident. And to congratulate a fellow I had visited in the um, Crumlin Road Jail and Peter McKehy, and he had, I heard he was engaged and I wanted to go up to congratulate him. So we went up to this pub up in that area. And he said to me right away, he says, Kathleen, did you go see Bree Giordano and Dwayne's mother? And I said, oh, no, not at this time of the night. It's like, um, it was like half 10 at night. And he said, no, go, please go. She would want to see you. And when I knocked on the door, she came and she embraced me, embraced me and called her husband, said, Brian, get out here. Look who's here. And we actually, they poured a toast and we actually toasted to, to Twain. And it was very emotional, but they were so grateful. Um, just that I paid this visit to um, to give my condolences. That that's the spirit of the Irish people. Um, they so appreciate everything. Thank you, Kathleen. You got ahead of me, and my last question you did. You answered that last question that I had about the families and uh, murders. And uh, I know that uh, you were asked by Norade to visit the families of the North Bona martyrs and offer condolences on behalf of that organization. And that this has been something uh, that you've done all along um, for um, those families who have uh, lost loved ones. And um, 
I originally had uh, mentioned to, to Jim before he met Kathleen that um, I wanted to somehow honor her and the work that she had done. And then he met her and said, oh, you got to get her to come and talk to us. And I, you know, we didn't know how we were going to do it. And I said to Kathleen that I wanted her to come and talk like my friends and that she was going to be meeting all my friends here. And that's what this is all about. So I want to honor Kathleen. Thank you so much for everything. <laughs> Just one last thing I wanted to say when you mentioned the Cornell Mattis, and um, when I was visiting in Cull Island, Seamus's uh, sister in law, we were very good friends, as I said. And she said to me, Kathleen, I think you should go up and visit these families. And I said, Oh, goodness, I, I'm not, um, I, I'm nothing in no rate, I'm just a member, I'm not an officer or anything. And, um, she said, no, you, you are Nori. I mean, this is, you should be doing this. And um, I said, oh my goodness, I don't know what to, okay, if, if you feel so, I'll, I'll go. So we went up to um, Kevin Barry O'Donnell's house. We went to the uh, Doris family. We went to, well, he wasn't in the Clinol Matas. He was, um, Tony Doris was with, was uh, part of a, a military uh, thing in Coke. And they were going, three guys were in the car and um, the car was, they, they came right and they ambushed them. And um, not only that, but the car burnt and they were burnt. So I went up to the Doris family. I went to the O'Donnell's. I went to, um, the, the, one of the fellows in Clano was, uh, was Peter Clancy. Um, his father owned uh, and ran the Shabine in that area. And so I went down to the Shabine. But what I was getting at is that, and the O'Farrells um, also, uh, they could not say enough thank yous. I didn't think I'd make any difference or what. And they just said, I can't believe you're here to take the time to give your condolences and um, the sincerity that you have for us. And so that really meant a lot to me. I realized that just one little thing sometimes, uh, it makes a big difference. It was, um, it was a wonderful experience in my life. And um, Ireland is still not free yet. So there's still a lot of work to do. And especially uh, writing and calling your senators, representatives to um, congressmen um, about this protocol. And um, this can't go through because um, we have to honor the Good Friday Agreement. And that was part of it. So let's hope and pray that someday we can get there to see a united Ireland. Tell back the fire. You better sing old sweet Caroline. No, no. He ain't did it. <laughs> when Kathleen was talking about um, going to see the people that had been killed murdered. Um, it brought me back to, to something that was important and I, and I thought about it as Kathleen was saying and it registered in my brain. It's a pretty small brain but it registered. Um, when Francis Hughes was being buried um, the RUC uh, tried to take uh, over the hearse that he was in and there was fighting back and forth. His family are behind him, um, bringing him for burial. There was an American crew, uh, news crew, who captured 
what was happening. And as soon as the RUC um, seen that there was an American crew uh, filming this, they stopped. And they were beating the driver of the hearse and and uh, and, and the passenger um, that were bringing and the soul of it, of of Francis Hughes to his final resting place. Um, Kathleen also mentioned the desecration of of, of bodies. Um, they used to have uh, they would have a watch at the the uh, Republican uh, cemetery because. Uh, there was widely known there was coercion between the RUC and the UDR and the UDF and the UFF um, and the British Army and the British government, and even the, the assassination of a solicitor. There was no, no, there was no barrier, there was no stopping it. They didn't care, but they used to dump manure on the, on the, on the grave sites of, uh, of uh, the Republican uh, plots. So, you know, um, people ask why. Um, you know, I, I've often thought about this as well, and it's um, they're called volunteers for a reason. They volunteer to give their life up for the freedom of Ireland. The British soldier is paid, he's trained, and he's given a weekly check to literally assassinate people. The biggest killers in Northern Ireland at one stage were called the Shankill Butchers. And they just killed you based on your religion. When you think about that, um, it's why a lot of people um, became members of the IRA, because their only protection on the six counties was uh, the Irish Republican movement. So I just want to say thank you to the people here because the impact that you have on the future of Ireland is massive. And Kathleen is an example of that in the last 40 years, 50 years that she has contributed to that. It, it's massive because they don't want Americans to be involved with the British government because basically the British government don't want talk to anyone. You know, we have six counties now that were trying to get a, a vote and that won't happen. So they were happy to have it their way and we played by their rules. Now let's play by the rules because we all made up the rules together and we all shook hands. Let's do what's right. Kathleen, I just want to say thank you for doing this. Thank you. I'm Bruce McCutcheon's sons, Darty and Roach, Donald Harrison, Michael Lee, the Queen. In darkened years of winter, I have passed. Summer awaits for spring before it leaves. In silence, we walk. Through the streets, as one by one our hunger strikers die. Oh, Harry Hughes and McCreation Sands, Darty and Lynch, and Donna Herson, my glory divine. Your pictures are forever in my mind. And my love for them, I will not disguise. And in silence, we walked through the streets. As one by one, our hunger strikers die. Oh no, Harry Hughes, the Christian sons, Darty and Lynch, McDonald Herson. My glory divine. In the silence we walked through the streets. As one by one our hunger strikers died.
Want to hear another one? <laughs> this Somebody here. Somebody wanted to do that. <laughs> I'll be getting thirsty over there. So yeah. a bit of a drink. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this here comes from uh, County Galway. It's uh, it's one of the most ancient drums to ever come out of Ireland. Um, the Scottish have the bagpipes. Um, we have the alien pipes and we have the drums. So some of you may have seen Braveheart. But this thing here, way better than Braveheart. <laughs> Um, Kathleen was talking about uh, so I have what's called I got OCD and that's not very good when you're going on the rabbit hole of the computer <laughs> but Kathleen mentioned the word and then it peeked into my head and it was the Gahaba he wrote so this was a, um, a song that I got during that whole pandemic the COVID we're all sitting at home FaceTiming and all that Twitter stuff and TikTok and all that um, I became great friends with a man by the name of John Gibb. John wrote a song called Irish Ways and Irish Laws. And uh, we've been friends ever since, but it's amazing. I became friends with people through Facebook and all that other stuff. <laughs> Once upon a time there was Irish ways and Irish laws, villages of Irish blood. Waken to the morning, waken to the morning. Then the Vikings came around, and they turned us up and turned us down. Started building boats and towns. They tried to change our living, tried to change our living. The woman and the soldiers came. Starts a centuries of shame, but they could not make us turn. We are ever flowing. We are ever flowing. Well, again, again, the soldiers came and they burned our fields and stole our grain. Shot the farmers in their fields, working for a living. Working for a living. Today the struggle carries on. And I wonder will I live so long. To see the gates bend up, bend up. To a people and their freedom. A people and their freedom. Where were you when the sun went down? I was just outside a port of town. Where were you when the sun came up? And the Gahabahi road, as the riots are all. Once upon a time there was Irish ways and Irish laws, villages of Irish blood, waking to the morning. Wake into the morning, it's come with the rainy number, it's come with the rainy bell, it's come with the rainy number, but tag of one, you jump up, Chega Walia, 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 Wake into the morning, wake into the morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You want to hear one more? I'm going to go for a drink. Yeah. Well, um, I've been delighted to play with a lot of different musicians over the years. A 
I'm going to age myself now, but I got the opportunity in 1994 to play support to the Clancy Brothers. I said the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, backstage in New York, um, when I started doing the music, someone said to me, you can't be doing Christy Moore all night. You can't be doing his music all night. And then Christy said to me, Finn, go right ahead. You're the only one I want to see playing it. But I met up. Um, a good few years ago. And I just remembered now that on the bow run, every time the Sean comes over, um, I get him to sign the bow run. And seemingly I forget every time that he signed it because I should only have someone sign it once, but um, Sean Sands seemingly just keeps on signing the old bow run and never says a word. So the last time he was over, um, I gave him a lend of the old guitar here and uh, he gave me a beautiful strap. So when I think of doing a gig with the Clancy Brothers, um, it doesn't, it, it pales in compare to playing uh, with Sean Sands. Uh, he's been a friend and a great advocate uh, for, for Irish freedom and for the Republican movement and for the people in America and, and also in Ireland. So I'd like to sing the song because I have only... Um, I was out one night and had a few drinks. I know. It went well, though. It went well. So Sean said to me, I, well, <laughs> that's Coca-Cola. I think it is over there. Um, but I had sang, um, Sean had asked me to sing Back Home in Derry, uh, that he, a song that his brother had written. And, uh, and it was a privilege for me after I had finished singing it. I got down and I was in heaven. And um, his son came over and said, Finn, you're the first person ever to sing that song in front of Sean. He usually does that one himself. But to me, it was a privilege to be on the same stage and in the same place. So if Sean is on that Zoom thing at some time in the future, because he was on the Zoom thing with me over there during that COVID era. Can you hear me now? I better hear you singing along to this one. I think they'll have trouble with this. In 1803, we sailed out to sea, out from the sweet town of Derry. For Australia bound, if we didn't talk around, at the marks of our feathers we carried. In a rusty and chains, we cry for our wains. A good women we let in sorrow. As the men tells and for the curses we heard, and the empire talks it tomorrow. At the mouth the foil bid farewell to the sign. It was down below deck to the line. Joe Darty screams, I walking out of a dream. By a vision of Paul Robert dying. And the sun burned through, and we dished out the groom. And a Connor, he was down with a fever. Sixty rebels today bound for Botany Bay, and many to reach their receiver. Oh, 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 Cursed him to hell as a boat on the swell, ship dancing like a mud in the firelight. White horses rode high as the devil passed by, bringing souls to Hades by twilight. Five weeks out to sea, we were now party tree, and we buried our comrades each morning. And in the wrong slime, we were lost in a time, it was endless night without dawn. A hell for a man to endow this whole life in slavery. 
For the climate was raw and the gun met a law. And in the wind, the rain came for bravery. Twenty years have gone by and I've ended my bond. My comrades go to walk behind me. Well, rebel I came, and I'll die the same. On the cold winds of night you will find me. On the 5th of May, Bobby Sands passed away, left his family and friends behind him. On hunger strike, they took his life, and nine other brave men they would find him. And Boston College, I didn't have much knowledge. You were going to her, Maggie Thatcher, on the 5th of May. At a Boston committee, I had little pity, for Bobby died on the 5th of May. Jim, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank Jim and George and Kathleen and give them a round of applause because without them I wouldn't be here. Here he comes. Come on over here now. Traveled around, we spent a lot of time in the six counties. We met a lot of Republicans. Everybody we were with, we told them about the Hunger Strike Monument and we showed them photographs of the quilt. Breathtaking what they had to say to us, how appreciative they couldn't believe that little old Rhode Island is putting up a monument to the Hunger Strike. Yeah. All I can say is morning. We have a part to play over there. It's a small part. Bobby Sands said uh, something like, everybody has a part to play no, how, no matter how small it'll be, or something like that. And this is what we're doing. And uh, one of the people we talked to was Dick McFarland, who was the OC during the hunger strike. He was very impressed with the, um, uh, with the quilt and with the monument that we showed him. He is also going to write his memory of the hunger strike that will be in the book. I'd like to just encourage everyone here when you're going out, take a paper from Francis, try to examine what the hunger strike meant to you, send it in. Maybe it'll be in the book, maybe it won't. We gotta see financially what we can afford, et cetera. But we wanna make a document that we can send to the Republican movement over there to show how much we care and appreciate what they sacrificed. And just one last thing. <laughs> This is all so sad, these stories, these songs. It's like, it, 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 it makes you crazy in some way. But an island still is a tree, and it's still a struggle, and it's still double-dealing lying bastards over there that we got to deal with, and we got to stay strong with this. But one thing that people should know, okay, some of our songs were about the hunger strikers, okay? And the hunger strikers gave their lives so that they didn't have to wear prison uniforms. They were not going to be considered criminals. They were political prisoners. They were prisoners of war, and they wanted to wear their own clothes. Was that asking so freaking much that then people had to die? But Kathleen was over there in the 80s, and she has a trove of photographs that prisoners sent to her from inside Long Kesh. Man, they're wearing costumes. They're wearing short pants. They were wearing their own clothes. The hunger strike won that demand. And when you see these photographs, it's amazing. They're putting on stage shows. And remember, they had the great escape. They started doing prison work so they could find out 
when the garbage trucks would come in and out, they hijacked the garbage truck and 23 guys escaped from the prison. That's <laughs> why, why they decided to do prison work. Yeah. But anyway, just thank you, Kathleen. God, thank you. And Marie. Marie. And, uh, and let me say to all of us, please come to the unveiling of the monument in uh, May and tell stories and songs again because this was this was just great. I uh, so had a good idea. What? What? The raffle? Oh, we got a raffle. Grab a chicken on the way out. There's some good prizes back there. And Grandpa had a what? <laughs> and Grandpa had a great idea. Why don't we get upstairs and have a drink? What? <laughs> No, that's next week. Oh, okay. So, all right. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. That's that's the um. Magella, do you want to um? Hello, Marie and Catherine. Thank you, Sarah, for, for um, putting us on Zoom. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a good night, everybody. Nice seeing you, Trish. Right. All right. All right, so I'll just end.